I'm the very first guest in the history of this program way back in the day. I love being on his show uh, once a week as I have, gosh, for 10 years now. Uh, he is the host of the ever popular Dan Patrick show, Dan Patrick. DP, how are you, sir? I'm great, Rich. Thank ha you. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you. Is that what you're supposed to say? Thank you. Is there a, is there a good yontif I that so. I should say? Is there, is, there a, is there an Irish version of good yontif that I should say for this? No, I don't even know if there's a, a much nachas either. <laughs> I, I just say happy St. Patty's Day. Everybody celebrates it. Come one, come all. Okay. And that's why I have you on the part of the reason why I have you on this program. Uh, Dan Patrick here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. I, I listen to your show every day going in here uh, in Los Angeles and I noticed uh, the, a couple of subjects that uh, you were uh, talking about at length today. First things first, Chris Borland. I'd love to hit you that on that subject first, again, for the lack of a better phrase. Uh, what, what do you think his retirement means as a greater whole, not just for his life, Dan? I think we're trying to make more out of it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think this is a 24-year-old who decided that this isn't what he wanted to do. I, I don't know if it's a referendum on football. I don't know what it means to viewers this next season. You know, do X number of people turn off the TV? They don't want to watch it. Or do you prevent your kids from playing? Will we see residual effect aftershocks 15, 20 years down the road? I don't know. I think there are questions you can ask. I, I just didn't see it as a game changer. Borland's a great story, but he decided that's not the career path that he wanted to take. The other retirements that we've seen, the early retirements, if you want to call it, with Maurice Jones-Drew and Patrick Willis, Jake Locker, those aren't concussion-related. This is, but I don't know if it changes people. I, I think you're still going to watch. There's going to be a different linebacker there in San Francisco next year, and we'll move on. Wait, the obvious difference with him, though, is he is a 24-year-old kid who has his faculties and is clearly very good at his job with a major career in front of him, and he is deciding to not do it for fear of injury or for fear of their, not even fear, just concern, and he'd rather not do it. And that is why yeah. a lot of uh, the Today Show, for instance, places that don't normally talk NFL in March are bringing this up. And that is the greater discussion that's being had in this regard right well, now. I think it's about it. parents, though, Rich. I, I think the discussion is, what's this going to mean for parents? That's right. why the Today Show would do this. They'd have no other reason to do it other than to say, are you afraid of your child playing football? Here's somebody who's 24 who decided to walk away. I applaud Chris Borland for doing it, if it's what he wanted to do. Um, you know, there are, other, there are a lot of other guys who may think about doing that, won't do it. He had the courage to do it. But I, I, I just didn't see it as a referendum here on the state of college or pro football. I just, uh, it, it, we, we know the risks that are there. It's a violent sport. We have a lot more information on concussions. But when you've had Junior say, I'll commit suicide, I don't know how many. Did anybody in the NFL say, you know, that's it? I'm walking away? That, that's somebody who actually killed himself. Dave Durison, Andre Waters, they killed themselves with concussion-related symptoms. Chris Borland's walking away. What is going to have more of a bigger impact on the NFL now and down the road? Borland walking away at 24 or some former NFL players in their 40s who were killing themselves? It does seem, though, that the media, uh, news media or folks uh, in our business, Dan, are, if the NFL is the coal mine, they're staring at the canary to see if it's twitching or they're seeing to see if it's difficult to breathe at all, waiting for the moment that there is any sea change in the popularity of this sport. Do you think there's some people that are trying to read into the Borland decision in that regard, or should we just let the kid make his decision and, and move forward? Well, I think it, it's, it's going to find its own level. It's water. You're going to find out if people mm -hmm. want to watch. You're going to find out if people want to play. You're going to find out if they want to watch pretty soon here in, what, six months. You're going to find out who wants to play. It may not be now. It might be a couple of years down the road when we see how many kids are playing pro football, college football, high school football. Are there high school programs that are shut down because of the fear of lawsuits or getting insurance there, uh, the cost of football? I think there's a lot of tentacles attached to it, but uh, there are a lot of agendas, let's say, put out 
earlier this morning and, and last night when we when we saw the Chris Borland story. Yeah, I know, and and uh, and you know the backlash for this kid's going to come that he has an agenda, and that he 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 re retired essentially to OTL um, as opposed to standing in in San Francisco, and I hope there is no backlash that comes his way in that regard. He has every right to do what he did and say what yeah, he did and, and live his life and let him go get his degree in Wisconsin. And I hope he does get a job in sports management if that's what his dream is. Yeah. You know, Jake Locker walked away. Did, right. Were people critical of Jake Locker because he no. found, lost his love for the sport? No. I, you know, if you, it's not for everybody. It's a, I, I tell people, if you want to find out just how violent the NFL is, you get the opportunity to watch a game on the sidelines. Oh, yeah. It will change your entire opinion of the sport. It, the violence in what's depicted on TV is nowhere near what it is on the sidelines. You hear everything. It is moving so fast. That's when you get the total awareness of, good God. I talked to Rodney Harrison. When we go to games on Football Night in America, we were in Seattle, Green Bay, Seattle, to open the season. He goes, mm -hmm. how did I play this game? And he played at a high level for the Patriots. So when he says, how did I play this game? You don't realize it when you're in it. You realize it when you're out of it yeah, even kid, more. Kids get stronger and faster at the combine every year too, DP. I mean, I, I, Mayock and yes. I look at each other and say, I, yep. can you believe this kid's running a four, sub 4.5, four, 40 at this size, at this weight? And if you put pads and a helmet on him. Um, and that's why I said at the top of this show, if, if fans are are – uh, being critical uh, towards the sport based on Borland's decision, then don't sit there and complain when the league removes kickoffs one day or the flag comes out for a helmet coming anywhere in here, the head or chest or neck area. That's just the way of the world now, and, and that's the way the, the, the sport needs to be adjudicated in a manner because these kids are getting bigger, stronger, and faster, and we do know the effects that these hits have later on in life. Well, we haven't changed the dimensions of the football field, but these guys have gotten bigger and stronger and faster. And I brought this up on the show earlier today. There's far more violence in the sport now because you have far more guys with the capability, the ability to inflict that kind of damage, that violence. You had guys back in the 60s and 70s, Deacon Jones or Dick Butkus, Mean Joe Green. But for all of those guys... I still have safeties who are bigger, as mm. big as linemen oh, yeah. are, you know, we're back in the 70s and the 60s. The, the dimensions haven't changed. The speed has changed. The size has changed. And how guys use their bodies to inflict violence has changed. That's why it's a far more violent sport. You got away with a lot more back in the 60s and 70s. But these guys will track you down, and when they hit you, they're, they're going to try to blow you up. Dan Patrick joining me here on The Rich Eisen Show. Uh, the Pete Rose reinstatement letter that went to Rob Manfred. I know you had the commissioner, the new commissioner of Major League Baseball, on your show last week. What do you think the commissioner can do with this application on his desk, DP? I, I don't know what the end game would be for baseball. What's baseball get out of this, that a 73-year-old man is on the Hall of Fame ballot? I'm not letting Pete hold a job. I don't think he's shown the true act of contrition here, but I, I would put him on the ballot. I would let his constituents decide. I'd let writers decide. That he's going into a museum. We're not putting him back on the playing field. Let people decide if, if and, and you're going to tell the whole story of Pete Rose. That's what, base, that's what the Hall of Fame is about. It's, it's telling the whole story. You can say, well, we're not going to honor him. Uh, are you really honoring him? He's a 73-year-old man. He's been shamed. He's been out of baseball for a long time. And you tell the whole story of Pete Rose in the Hall of Fame. Just like we're going to have to tell the whole story of A-Rod or Bonds or Clemens or any of those guys. And what's the difference here? Mm -hmm. Pete cheated the game by betting on it as a manager. These guys cheated the games on a daily basis by what they did to their bodies. It, you know, is it apples and oranges? Are they both wrong? Do we keep everybody out of here? I get the feeling the steroid guy's got a better chance of getting in than Pete Rose does. But if I'm the commissioner, I also got to look at Bud Selig and say, Bud, I'm going to go against your ruling. Yeah, right. As you said over your dead body, you would never go back on what Bart Giamatti did with Pete Rose and made him sign away his future. That's going to be the tough part here. Uh, if I thought it helped baseball become cooler, uh, younger kids would be more interested if Pete Rose was going to go into the Hall of Fame, then I'd say, great. I just don't know if there's an end game. What, what does baseball get out of this? 
We know what Pete does. I don't know if baseball gets enough back in return. Maybe baseball makes him go on a tour of some sort. Um, and my idea is is he has he should become an advocate uh, to prevent sports gambling. To go there and say, look what it's done to me. Look what it's done to my life. I'm a 73-year-old man finally getting a second chance. Don't be like me. In a similar way that what Mickey Mantle did talking about his alcoholism and what it did to his life, his family, uh, prior to uh, his uh, demise, literal. But for Pete Rose, maybe this is what baseball does with this opportunity, and Pete can then come back and maybe even as a, a fully reinstated member of the sport. What do you think? I can't make him fully reinstated, but, but I, I've said before, even said to Pete, if he had gone around to minor league ballparks and had autograph signings without getting paid and, and talked to these kids mm -hmm. about what he did and what he gambled on and threw away, I think baseball would have had a little bit easier time reinstating him because he would have given back to the game. There would have been contrition. There never was. Pete didn't admit he, admit he bet on baseball until he got paid to write a book. That's the problem I've always had with Pete. I grew up in Cincinnati. I, you know, I never got cheated when I saw Pete play. But when it came to what he did to the game, he signed his future away. Um, I hope there's a second chance there, but a second chance where everybody would kind of benefit here. And if that's the case, I could see baseball doing it. Um, I just hope Pete doesn't get in posthumously. Uh, I think he, I'd love to see that speech at Cooperstown. Uh, I think that that would be that'd be pretty incredible to see that. Chris Brockman, before Dan goes out the door for St. Patrick's Day, hit him up with the poll question at richeisenshow.com, please. Dan, uh -oh. it is St. Patrick's mm. Day. What is the best Irish import? Is it U2, Guinness, the great Olivia Wilde, <laughs> or Liam Neeson, who has a special set of skills? What do you think, DP? It's, we run the gamut here. Could have gone Kathy Ireland. Could have gone there, but that's that might be a little Olivia too old Wilde school for you. Olivia Wilde of Irish mm. descent. Okay, got it. DP, what do you think? Uh, I'm gonna go Guinness there because go. it's actually good for you. It's like mother's milk. <laughs> it's, uh, it's good for you. The other ones, I don't know if they're they're always good for you, yeah. but Guinness is good for you. You're There's a, a sign in Ireland. I have you're double. Milk. You know? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're you're a health nut, Dan. Yeah. yeah. I know. I understand that. You're going to go with that. Where does that rank right <laughs> yes. now? Is that running away with the poll? Uh, right Guinness now? is in second place. Behind. The oh. lovely Olivia Wilde. Yeah. There's more red-blooded people out yeah. there, I guess, in that regard, Dan. Well, let's put it this way. I'd like to have a Guinness with Olivia Wilde while <laughs> listening to you two yes. and hoping that Liam Neeson is tracking down the killers. <laughs> <laughs> well done, DP. That's next level, as, as we would say. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern. On Audience.